Hello students of Dynamics, we are today going to take a journey into a new coordinate system, which is the tangent normal coordinate system. Now tangent normal is a really handy coordinate system for motion because we've basically isolated all of the velocity into the tangent. Okay, any kind of motion along the path. So you could think of this as when you're driving a car, uh, maybe it's on a curvy road, like this, maybe it's on a straight road. But when you hit the gas pedal, you are changing the tangential velocity of your car. Okay, you hit the brake, you're changing the tangential acceleration of your car. Okay, you're changing this magnitude, time rate of change of the magnitude of the velocity. Now, when you go either up over these hills or if you go around a horizontal curve, then you need an acceleration to stay toward the center of that curvature. And that happens to be a normal acceleration. So normal axis is always going to be towards the center of curvature. Um, and so once again here, just to re reiterate here, we're saying that the tangential axes, the positive tangential axes, is in the direction of velocity. So our velocity vector is always in the positive t, and our normal acceleration, a sub n, is always... in the positive normal axis direction. Okay, it just works out that way. If, if the velocity changes direction, then so does the tangential axis. If the curvature changes in direction, so does the normal axis. So another way to think about these axis systems is that they actually move with the particle. Okay, x, y, Cartesian axis system always stays in one place tangent and normal move with the particle okay so using those pieces of information i've got a little practice for you all and so i'd like you to complete this i'll actually have you pause the video and go ahead and complete this little exercise and then um, restart it when you're done but fundam fundamentally what we have in this problem is we have a particle this particle is moving along a sine curve y is equal to um, sine of 2x and its velocity is increasing between 0 and pi over 2. Okay, noting right here, this middle point is pi over 2. And that it is decreasing from pi over 2 over 2 pi. So essentially where your um, the position is positive y, it's going to be an increasing velocity. Um, you're going to have an abrupt change of that velocity. It's going to be decreasing um, from pi over 2 to pi or from, you can think, in these negative y values. Okay, So this is like the path of a particle in xy space. So what I want you to do is for these three locations, for point 1, 2, and 3, is to draw the tangent and normal axis system. We always draw these axes in the assumed positive direction. Use the definitions above to help you do that. Draw also the velocity vector of the particle. Magnitude doesn't matter, just to get the right direction. And then also draw both of the acceleration vector components. All right, so go ahead and pause the video. All right, we're back. Hopefully you all drew out this sketch and drew on all these different terms. If you're not playing along with me, if you're not actually doing the work, um, it will be harder to learn, okay? So I'll leave that up to you. But uh, for point one, we know that this particle is moving along this curve, always from left to right. And so our tangent axis is going to be tangent to that curve. Our normal axis is toward the center of curvature. So that's coming back in this direction here. There's tangent, there's normal. Our velocity is always in the tangent direction. So let's get and add that here. So there would be, call this my V1 as a vector. And that my acceleration, we said the particle is slowing down between, excuse me, it's increasing between zero and pi over two. And so if it's increasing, that means that our acceleration is also going in the direction of that velocity. There is our a sub t, here is our a sub n, okay, our tangent component and our normal component. 
This would be the same thing for point two. For point two, particle continues to move along this path. There's my tangent. So our normal axis is going toward the center of this part of the curve. Now our velocity will continue to be in the positive tangent direction. So this will be my velocity at two. And if we take a look at the components of our acceleration, we actually have a very small normal acceleration. Um, normal acceleration we'll see in our equations is actually a function of both velocity and also radius. And this is a very broad radius. Okay, so it doesn't need a lot of acceleration to stay in this curve. And we said that it is now um, slowing down. Okay, so our tangential acceleration a sub t is in the negative tangent direction. And we do the same thing here for point three. It's going to be kind of similar to point two. And we have the tangent axes, the normal axes, our velocity in the tangent direction. This is V3. Our acceleration term still slowing down in the negative tangent, A sub T. And then my normal here, A sub N. And I guess I could have put subscripts in the acceleration as well. A, so these last ones here could have been A3 sub T or A T sub three, um, but we'll just leave them as A N and A T. Okay, so tangent and normal axis system moves with the particle. The tangent direction is always tangential to the curve, which lines it up with the velocity. The normal acceleration is always toward the center of curvature, putting it in the positive normal axis direction. And the tangential acceleration is going to flip-flop whether the particle is speeding up in magnitude or slowing down in magnitude. So it turns out that for tangent and normal, just like for Cartesian, we also have unit vectors. So if we have an axis system that might look something like this, let's say this is normal, tangent is always gonna be perpendicular to that. Sorry, it's off the bottom of the screen. I can add some unit vectors to this. Unit vectors are still gonna be one unit in length. And uh, they're always pointing in the positive axis direction. We tend to label the one along the normal, either, I like the term n hat. Um, a lot of textbooks will use e, hat sub n and here for tangential i often use t hat but a lot of books will use e hat sub t okay i've also seen in other books they'll use u um, hat sub t okay so some different options but they're all just referring to the unit vector along the tangent, unit vector along the normal. When we're looking at notation for um, these tangent normal vectors, I often will use one of the following. Either you could write your acceleration, say, as a magnitude, say 3.6 in the t hat plus 4.1 in the n hat, and acceleration would always have units of length, say, meters per second squared probably officially should put some brackets around there just to show that the units are times the whole thing. I also like using these hard bracket form and the order I tend to put is tangent and then normal. And so this would be three, would give us 3.6 comma 4.1 in meters per second squared. So when using this bracket formation on an xy problem, of course, it's x and y, tangent normals, t then n, as we'll get into cylindrical coordinates, uh, also, also called spherical coordinates, we'll use r and then theta. It's kind of the designated order inside those brackets. Now, there is a separate video which explicitly derives all of the vector terms for the velocity and the acceleration in tangent and normal coordinates. Coming out of that video is that our, our velocity vector expressing in tangent normal, we can write this as 100% of our velocity is in the tangent and none of it is in the normal. Once again, this is tangent and then normal. The acceleration in the tangent all of this, actually, let me express this instead of separately. Let's go ahead and put these together. So my acceleration overall is going to have a tangential component, A sub T. That can be positive or negative. The normal component, the most common version of the normal component for particles 
is v squared over rho. Now there are all some art there are some alternative forms. Um, let's just leave it as v squared over rho for now, because that's the one that we'll end up using for the first half of class. Once again, that's for particles. There's a number of problems that we end up getting our path expressed as an equation, right? So like y is equal to a function of x um, for your path. And if you have an equation like this given, you typically need to find then the radius of that curvature. Okay, and there's actually been a derived equation for this. Uh, it's not the simplest of equations, but it works. So rho is that radius of curvature. Let me define that here. Rho is the radius of curvature. And so rho in this equation is equal to 1 plus the dy dx derivative squared that entire term raised to the 3 halves divided by, this is like a an order of operations uh, practice for you, the absolute value of the second derivative dy squared dx. Okay, so the second spatial derivative of y with respect to x. And so these are not time derivatives. These are just purely, you can think, um, the one here on the top is the slope. Right, the slope of the path. And fundamentally, the second derivative dy dx is actually the curvature of that path. It tells you the concavity. And just noting here that this is the absolute value. So just to give you an application of this equation, let's say that we have the equation um, y is equal to 0.3x squared, and this is uh, an equation in meters, and we want to find, so we'll say that if we have that equation, we want to find rho at, go ahead and move over here, 0.5 meters. Okay, so we have an equation, y is a function of x, and we need to find our rates of curvature at a half meter, so go ahead and computing some of these different terms. Let's go ahead and leave our equation showing there. We can find that our dy dx, the first spatial derivative with respect to x of that equation, is going to equal 0 0.6 times x. Now we could go ahead and compute that at this x is equal to 0 0.5 meters by plugging in the 0.5 and end up with a value here of 0 0.3, right? So that's the um, known value at 0 0.5 meters. The second derivative, d squared y divided by dx squared, that is going to equal the derivative of 0.6 dx. So that's just going to be 0 0.6, just that coefficient remaining. And we don't need to plug anything in there because it's just a constant value, so 0 0.6. So plugging all of these values into our equation above, I'll just go ahead and write it up top here. We can have that rho at 0.5 is equal to 1 plus 0 0.3 squared. All of that raised to the 3 halves divided by 0 0.6. And because 0 0.6 is already positive, we don't really have to worry about the absolute value, but this equals 1.897 meters. Okay, so this would be your answer. Sorry, a little bit out of order here, but there's your answer for the radius of curvature at y is equal to 0.3 times x squared. And if you take a look, there's a, a link in the description below in on YouTube of um, a GeoGebra Interactive that lets you play around with one of these sine curves. And you can see how the radius of curvature changes in size as your particle moves along that curve.
Hopefully this was a quality introduction to tangent normal motion and how the tangent normal axes work, finding a radius of curvature, and a series of other pieces. And I hope you have an awesome day.